ruling party of China's Taiwan suffered a landslide loss in local elections on Saturday with its chairperson stepping down to take the blame only two years after she came into power as leader of the island. What has led to the rapid downfall of the party and what lies ahead? And California's deadly fires are finally contained. President Trump blamed the fires on bad management while a government-issued report pointed to climate change, which is the bigger problem. How helpful are conflicting viewpoints in preventing future disasters? Welcome to The Point. Live from Beijing, I'm Li Xin. Taiwan's ruling Democratic Progressive Party, or DPP, suffered a heavy loss in the local elections on Saturday. According to the island's election affairs authority, the DPP was only able to land six among the 22 county and city chief posts, while the opposing Kuomintang Party won 15 seats and the remaining one went to an independent candidate. Immediately following the defeat, Taiwan's leader and also chairperson of the DPP, Tsai Ing-wen, announced her resignation as the chair of the party and took responsibility for the party's landslide loss. The spokesperson on the second day of the Taiwan Affairs Office of the State Council said on Sunday the mainland will continue to enhance solidarity with Taiwan compatriots and follow a path of peaceful development of cross-strait relations. What do the election results say about the political climate in Taiwan and what influence will the results have on cross-strait relations? Joining me later from Taipei, we will have Joanna Lei, a former Taiwan legislator, but for now, let's first Let's go to Shanghai, where, President, uh, where Professor Shen Ding Li from Fudan University joins us now. Professor Shen, thank you very much for joining us. Well, um, last Saturday, as I said, Kuomintang claimed an overwhelming victory, uh, claiming 15 seats out of the 22 total counties and um, cities in Taiwan, while the DPP won only six. Let's flip time back to 2014. During the last election, it was a completely different picture where the T DPP nailed 13 out of the 22 and uh, the Kuomintang only had six seats. So, and that happened in a matter of only four years. What led to the change of color in Taiwan? Because people say under DPP majority, um, everything was green, and under Kuomintang rule, everything was blue. Now it seems that we again flip from majority green to majority blue. Well, there are many reasons. Uh, I think uh, the most important uh, being that uh, the DPP has not done economy well. It has uh, failed the people's expectation, especially in Kaohsiung. So uh, people now accept the new mayor's uh, argument. Kaohsiung is now both poor and old. And they want Kaohsiung to be energetic, to be young, and uh, to be rich. So this uh, is the new uh, uh, level of Kaohsiung. Uh, probably also the level of Taiwan and the DPP. So people feel disappointed, so they switched their uh, 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 acceptance, uh, mm -hmm. this time in okay. favor of KMT. Well, what was the reason behind the bad performance of uh, the Taiwan economy? Uh, was it because of the poor management of the DPP government? Was it because of its political stance when it comes to cross-strait relationship? Because uh, since Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen came into power, she has refused to endorse the 1992 consensus, meaning there is only one China. She refuses to recognize that. So that has led to the uh, de rapid deterioration of uh, cross-strait relations. How important is that factor there? Well, all this uh, uh, contribute to the fiasco of the, deep, uh, of the DPP this time, uh, especially the playing of the independence card by Tsai Ing-wen has much hurt uh, Taiwan's opportunity. Uh, prior to that, actually at the time of uh, Mr. Ma ying uh, governance, uh, the two sides across Taiwan Strait uh, got uh, uh, nice business. And the two sides are talking about uh, how to promote each other's uh, business. Mm -hmm. So we, we welcome their investment in mainland and we send lots of tourists and we purchase lots of Taiwan's uh, goods. 
Uh, well, some people would say, for uh, instance, Mind Joe. Agriculture. Yeah, you, you said my, you mentioned Mind Joe. Mind Joe, it was the former head of the Kuomintang Party or the KMT. However, it was mm. um, having a very good relationship across uh, with the mainland counterparts, and yet it didn't secure the election in 2014. What happened then? How come you know their good political view didn't didn't well, deliver to the Taiwanese people? And what changed this time that KMT won? Well, this time maybe not uh, KMT has been doing well, but the uh, DPP had doing had been doing very bad. Last time when Ma Ying-jeou lost uh, the majority, uh, he was not doing well in managing the uh, the intra-party's uh, leadership. He could not manage his relationship with colleagues, and he could not uh, tell Taiwan people that uh, to do good business is in the interest of Taiwan. Therefore, young people, uh, they may feel frustrated because their job out opportunity uh, does not meet their expectation. But at this time, they feel more frustrated. Under the uh, DPP, uh, they do not receive uh, good benefits. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, co comparing with KMT and DPP in two years, they probably concluded that uh, KM KMT is not good, but DPP is even worse. Well, it seems that uh, it's, it's kind of a, a helpless situation. However, they are again giving the KMT <laughs> another that opportunity, right, to, to let them try again and, and see whether they can uh, deliver this time and meet their expectations. Uh, however, it does. Um, the, the news has been uh, welcomed by the, uh, the mainland uh, side. For instance, Ma Xiaoguang, as I said, the spokesperson of the Taiwan Affairs Office of the State Council, said on Sunday that the results reflected the strong will of the public in Taiwan in sharing the benefits of peaceful development across the Taiwan Strait and desires to improve the island's economy and people's well-being. He also added that we'll continue to uphold the 1992 consensus and to resolutely oppose separatist elements advocating Taiwan independence and their activities. So, uh, Professor Shen, what do you think uh, are some of the key messages that the mainland side is trying to send at this moment in response to the election results? Well, I think we wait and see to see how Taiwan people would compare uh, their past and uh, their current situation. They would make a wise, wise uh, decision. Uh, they used to be uh, frustrated with Kuomintang. They do not have a, a good unity and uh, internal uh, solidarity. And Kuomintang could not translate its economic performance uh, to uh, people's trust. But uh, what is the alternative? With uh, DPP's leadership, it uh, played the independence card. It uh, refused to, uh, uh, to accept uh, the one China's principle. It uh, has uh, no idea uh, to recognize 1992 uh, consensus, okay. which is one China. They can interpret what is their definition one China, but it has to be one China. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm, I've just been told that uh, our guest from Taiwan, Joanna Lei, is able to join us now. So, Joanna, it's nice to have you on the show, although slightly later than usual. But uh, uh, what is your reaction to the uh, latest uh, results? What do you think it was a vote of this time? Was it a vote of no confidence to, to Taiwan as a leader of Taiwan? As the leader of Taiwan, was a vote of no confidence? for the DPP, a vote of failure for the DPP, or a vote of another opportunity for the KMT in, in, the, next, in the near future? Well, I think it's a no vote to the party leaderships of both KMT and DPP. While it doesn't seem to be quite likely that the KMT having a landslide victory, but people do think it's still a vote of no confidence to its party leadership. But it is quite clear that this time the people's voice is heard loud and clear. In addition to the general election, there are also 10 different referendums, all 10 showed extremely clearly that the DPP major policies, including the non-nuclear power plant policy, their long-standing Taiwan independence position, and their position in the uh, family issues, are all being told loud and clear that people do not support them. They received 60 to 80 percent of the voters 
saying, no, don't do that. It's not the policy that we have mandated you to do. We supported you, not for these reasons. One of the most important ones certainly relates to the cross-strait relations, which is the referendum number 13. So it is very clear that the KMT landslide victory is brought by a very surprising candidate in the South, who is now the most noted person in Taiwan, Han Guoyu, and probably in a lot of different places as well. In addition to that, the KMT's long-standing position of having a better cross-strait relations in order to better the livelihood of people in Taiwan is now being echoed, supported, and touted loud and clear in Kaohsiung, the southern part of Taiwan. So I think it's a great decision-making by the people, and it's a great result for all the parties for them to think carefully on how to respond and react to the people's voice. So we have still over a year before the next uh, leader's election for Taiwan. What do you think the mainland can do with, its, uh, with its, uh, the, uh, the winning candidate city and counties uh, in, in Taiwan in order to quickly repair their relationship and prepare for the next uh, coming leader of Taiwan? Joanna. Well, it is very clear that during the last um, 18, 12, 20 over months of the DPP rule, many, many of the jurisdictions in Taiwan suffered economically. They also suffered from lack of opportunities. They suffered from internal disputes. So with the winning parties being very clearly supporting a better cross-strait relations, it is something that people do hope to see that the cross-strait relations is improved during the next month or not next year or so and during that period for the jurisdictions that have very clearly voted for a better cross-strait relations. And so uh, in that sense, mainland China's position is extremely important. Yeah. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned Han Guoyu, uh, this person who is uh, um, being dubbed uh, the Trump in Taiwan, but this time in a, in a good sense because he's uh, very outspoken. Sometimes he even mm. used uh, um, um, non-politically correct words, if I can say. Uh, what kind of potential does he have? What kind of potential impact, Joanna, do you think he's going to have on, cr on cross-strait relations? Well, certainly Han Guoyu is an unconventional leader in the KMT camp. He is unconventional, he is direct, outspoken, and he's being touted as a people leader. So in that sense, in Kaohsiung, he will be able to tout a new direction that is a very pragmatic cross-strait relations and not ideological at all. And that is actually the theme of his campaign. He's telling the so-called most deep green part of Taiwan that Perhaps we can think about cross relations in a different way. Think about how it can benefit Taiwan, how it can benefit your own livelihood, how it can benefit your own city. And that particular campaign is extremely successful. You can see in the massive support he received. And may I add, I've been back in Taiwan for 18 years by now. I've seen leaders like Ma ying and a lot of the Pan Blue leaders. I have never seen anyone being so supported and so loved as Han Guoyu. Well, so in that sense, yeah. he will definitely be a very important, it will be a force to grapple with, and he will be a very important force in KMT's reform. Okay, we'll keep a close watch on the situation. Many thanks to my two guests, Joanna Lei, former Taiwan legislator, and Professor Shen Ding Li at Fudan University from Shanghai. You have been watching The Point with me, Liu Xin. We'll take a short break, and when I come back, California's deadly wildfires have been contained, but crucial questions remain. Experts claim climate change played a major role, but President Trump blames the gross mismanagement of the forests. Who's right and why does it matter? Stay with me. Thousands of homes devoured, over 85 lives lost so far, over 200 still missing, and hundreds of thousands of acres of earth scorched. After more than two weeks of catastrophic destruction, both of California's wild, two wildfires have been contained. However, the fires have left behind a trail of sheer devastation and many questions. Although human factors are believed to have played a role, many experts attribute the worst forest fires in California in a century to climate change 
change, including authors of a White House report quietly released last Friday. The fourth National Climate Assessment Report warns that these types of disasters are getting worse in the U.S. because of global warming. One of the report's authors said in an article that uh, the report makes it clear that climate change is not some problem in the distant future. It is happening right now in every part of the country. This was in sharp contrast to U.S. President Donald Trump's well-known stance on climate change. So what exactly caused the de destructive fires? What lessons can be learned to prevent another such a catastrophe? Is this fire or report likely to change in any way the mind of those who deny climate change? Joining me here in the Beijing studio is uh, Wu Changhua, China Asia Director at the Office of Jeremy Rifkin, and from Tel Aviv, Israel Richard Hardiman, Senior Lecturer at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, welcome to both of you. Mr. Hardiman, let me go to you first. At this moment, I know it is a bit too early as the fires have just been contained and normally it takes months, if not longer, to determine the exact cause of a forest fire. But at this moment, what do we know as to the possible causes um, according to your understanding so far? Yes, uh, good evening. Good evening, Beijing. Um, regarding the, the forest fires, I, I think uh, we, we had to look at different uh, factors. First of all, I fully agree with the conclusions of that climate change report that it is with us here now. And then we go to look at the fires themselves and what was the cause of those fires, which is still in the process of investigation. And then we look at the, the mitigations that can be taken place and what policies have to be invoked to, to reduce that effect in the future. Uh, if we look at the primary cause, and I'm talking about climate change, I want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, these fires are carrying it out on the west coast of the United States. And we had similar situations in Europe along the west coast of Portugal also this year and also last year. So what are the similarities there? The similarities are one is wind and the second one is drought. Why do we have wind? Because the temperatures difference between the land and the sea is increasing. That difference is increasing. I give a simple example. If you put a kettle on a fire to heat, it will take you five minutes to heat up that kettle. Mm -hmm. If you put a frying pan on that fire, it would take you 30 seconds. So now, there's what is less happening water. is yeah. that differential okay. in temperature is causing the wind. Yeah, yeah, I see. Well, it's causing wind, mm -hmm. and that wind is blowing into the, the land. Okay, so basically it is... Now, when you have wind it is and drought, pretty clear. you have fire. Right, it is pretty clear. But how come... I can't help. I can't help going back to President Trump uh, in his initial assessment and his consistent um, point of view. Uh, well, up to now, that he has said there, there is practically no contribution of climate change behind the uh, California forest fires. Um, Ms. Wu here. Uh, in the beginning, he had this tweet, which I believe was given out on November the 10th, where he blamed the. Um, the cause of the fire to uh, gross uh, forest mismanagement. Let's take a look at that. He says there is no reason for these massive, deadly, and costly forest fires in California except that forest management is so poor. Billions of dollars are given each year with so many lives lost, all because of gross mismanagement of the forests. Remedy not now or no more Fed payments. I mean, that, of course, drew a lot of uh, uh, criticism, the, f the, the way how he talked about. Uh, punishing people. But um, Ms. Wu, how important is forest management in terms of uh, uh, preventing forest fires? It's absolutely important. We all know actually forests, uh, pretty in large parts of the country in California, needs to be protected. That's why the U.S., from the government perspective, they have a state forest uh, service, which is a government department, a federal level. And there's a whole system, a whole team and, uh, to manage the forest. So there's no doubt, no denial at all that the job, you know, the, the state, the, the forest service, uh, does is very very critical to make sure 
you know, disasters not probably prevented or controlled or reduced or whatever. Uh, so, but that doesn't mean actually, uh, if you particularly look at California, the, the wildfire we're mm. talking about here, we all know very, very clearly climate change played a big role. Of course, the trigger could be potentially because of human induced, uh, uh, as the professor mentioned as well. Uh, I think the real uh, causes of the file are still under investigation, so we'll see what's going to be concluded at the end. But in the meantime, uh, you know, for this big the steel, the, the size, the scale, and also the impact that the Wi-Fi has had so far is definitely, you know, mostly because of the climate change issues. Well, the report also says that uh, the lower 48 states of the United States have uh, warmed 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit or 1 degree Celsius since 1900 with 1 1.2 Fahrenheit degrees Fahrenheit in the last few decades. And uh, if you look at, you know, the, the, the span of the time versus the, the degree of change, it doesn't seem to be that much. I mean, does it really make so much of a difference? Um, Mr. Hardiman, just now you were talking about putting a pan on fire. That's pretty dramatic, but you've, uh, you, if you have over 100 years and just one degree of, of a temperature does, d difference, does that really make fires, a uh, forest so much more, um, you know, burnable? Yeah, yeah okay. In, in, in terms of climate change, first of all, one degree does make a big difference. But what we're talking about here is extreme events. Extreme events, whether these be droughts, floods, fires, typhoons, hurricanes, etc. Now, these extreme events, as I, I indicated earlier, can be affected by this differential between land and sea temperatures. And uh, the extreme events have their difficulty in measurement, whether becoming more intense or less intense, because of their infrequency. But the indications are, I've just, I looked at data from 1950 up until the present of the intensity and the acreage burned in California in forest fires, and they are definitely on the increase. So there seems to be indic indicative that we do have an intensity of forest fires increasing, that we do have an intensity of uh, extreme events increasing globally, not only in California. Yeah. Well, the California governor, Jerry Brown, who met President Trump at the site, he has been quite vocal about the impact of uh, climate change on fires in his state. He said that the conditions have created a new abnormal where the fire season lasts all year. Uh, Ms. Wu, how would you how, can help us understand the situation? How possible can it be that the fire season uh, really becomes so long throughout the year? Because of climate change, as we're talking about here today, and uh, it's already a fact, it doesn't matter whether President Trump believes in climate change or not, it is a reality. As you mentioned uh, earlier through the data, the temperature increase in the continental U.S. Uh, happens to be even faster, higher than you know, global average, and uh, particular on the west coast of California, and, uh, which seems to be uh, suffering even more risk at this moment. As the professor mentioned as well, the data you know, in the last 50 years or so, maybe last century, uh, the intensity and the frequency of uh, uh, forest fire, extreme events happening in that region definitely has been increasing. And all the facts point to the fact that climate change is happening and is happening sort of way beyond uh, you know, human oh, beings' okay. management capabilities. Well, it sounds, I mean, the report sounds very authoritative. Uh, what I understand is it's a 1,500-page report uh, gathering the, uh, the finding of uh, 13 federal agencies of the U.S. government to develop the report using the best available science and and yet um, according to the report that was released last time the national climate assessment published in 2014 mr. Hardiman warmer temperatures alone do not cause fires but drought and insect outbursts that kill trees and plants create more fuel that helps fire spread adding wildfire risk in California and other western state uh, is there a contradiction here between different versions of this report Um, again, um, I would emphasize the fact that increase in temperature, of course, that's going to cause pest outbreaks and it's going to have its various consequences. But I, th I think here we have key factors. One is wind, the other is drought. And this is what is causing the, uh, the, the forest fires. This is the major cause. Okay. Whether it be by human error, uh, intentional or whatever.
Well, President Trump's uh, argument here is that the bigger problem um, is human error instead of climate change. Can we really compare these two? Mr. Hardiman again. Well, um, one of the latest reports actually placed some of the blame on um, its PG&E, which is a Pacific Gas and Electric, where they have their transformers and their lines, and apparently the high winds called branches to brush against these electric lines and cause sparks and flashes, which initiated the fires. So you could say that this was uh, human blame. Um, PG&E decided not to turn the power off, which apparently is a mistake. So yes, you can blame that on, on human error. So there needs to be a decision-making process, both in policy, in looking right. at how do okay. we deal with incidents okay. like this when they occur. I, I think exactly there is the problem because we have conflicting views. President Trump does not believe in uh, climate change, not even after the fires have been raging for days. And uh, uh, right now his uh, Secretary of Agriculture, for instance, came out to say this report indicates that climate change is behind this, uh, this, these fires. So, Ms. Wu, what's the implication in the fight against uh, forest fires when you have such conflicting views coming out of the same administration? It could be a problem, uh, meaning at the federal level, uh, if you have your team, you know, uh, which has a different opinion, uh, you know, from, with the boss, and uh, so when you make decisions, and in terms of, you know, uh, uh, natural disaster or emergency response and uh, federal budget, budget allocation and uh, how the budget should be spent, whatever. So potentially there could be a challenge. But in reality, and uh, I think at the end of the day, President Trump has changed his opinion and decision and decided to release uh, you know, the funding support for California. Uh, so hopefully that's going to help tremendously. But fundamentally, I think uh, back to the difference of opinion between the president in office and the part of the cabinet member, I think that's probably that's pro 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 problematic. Uh, now, actually, it's encouraging to see the Secretary of Agriculture coming out and using the language. Mm. If you look at the last couple of years, President Trump even sort of ordered that climate change shall not appear in many, many of the government documents. That, that obviously have changed. Okay, we have to leave it there. Many thanks to Wu Changhua, China Asia Director at the office of uh, Jeremy Rifkin and uh, from Tel Aviv, Israel Richard Hardiman, Senior Lecturer at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. By the way, it is indeed very sad for the human and property losses mm, of all those people. Uh, we're going to leave it there. Many thanks. And uh, as usual, follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with Alex. Download, download the application for CGTN to watch the show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. You've got the point.